I don't know who this word is for, but since I don't know who it's for, then it must be for everybody. So the Lord says, and you know, he tells me so such ordinary stuff that it boggles my mind that he comes right down to earth where the rubber meets our road. And he said, I just heard him say, I've done a really good job when I created you. I created you perfectly. I created you for purpose. And I value you. And when I created you, I looked at my creation of you and I said, it is good. It is very good. And so look at yourself as my creation, my special creation, says the Lord. And stop condemning what I have created. For I have made you for purpose. I value you. I take meticulous care of you. I watch over you night and day. I promised and I fulfill it to lead you and guide you into all truth. I promised that I would be with you always, and I am, and I will be. And you are at the same time with me. That's the relationship that I wanted when I created you. And that is what thrills me, says the Lord, that you are my sons and daughters, that you belong to me. And it thrills me that I also belong to you, that I am your God, that I am your Savior, that I am your healer, that I am your caregiver, that I am the one that takes care of every detail of your existence, just as I created you with detail. So I continue to do detailed care of you and I will continue to do that the rest of your earthly sojourn and then you will be forever more with me says the Lord when I first said this word I thought it's for Sylvia then I thought well I don't know who it's for you know but it is for you and it's for Randy and it's for Kath it's for all of us here it's for whosoever wants to receive that word that we are his special creation and he loves us he adores you and he adorns you with his spirit he adorns you with his self that's why he cares about our state of affairs that's why he cares about the estate of our heart that's why he is there to to bring us into a closer relationship with him it's for our good he doesn't want us harmed. He loves us. He's invested himself into every part of our lives. And that's what he's still doing. He's, you're an investment when he created you. And he invested himself in you. And when we invest something in a business, uh, in our country anyway, at the end of the year, we have to declare what kind of a business it is. And sometimes we lose when we are dealing with our profits and losses. And we come out not having any assets, not having anything that's a plus at the end. We spent more than what came in. And so there's a little box that says different things that you can say. And one of them says all investment is at risk. And so it is with all of our investments. All investments are at risk. But when God invested himself in us by giving his son, he gave the best. And he could say all investment was at risk because many people would shun him. Many people would despise him and reject him and reject the plan of God, which was a precious plan for every person on the face of the earth. It wasn't for somebody. It was for everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was for every single sinner, which was all of us. And so all of his investment when God gave the son was at risk, knowing that many would reject him, that many would forsake him, that many would betray him, not just Judas, but there are many betrayers even today. 
that there are many that would deny him. It wouldn't be just Peter, that there would be many that would swear like Peter did. I never knew you, and, and even curse and swear. Many of them would take the name of the Lord in vain. And so all investment in the human race was at risk that perhaps not one person would be saved, although whom he foreknew he did predestine. So he knew that there would be a remnant. He knew that there would be many that would come to him. But he also knew that it's a narrow path and a straight path. And he said few would be there that would find it. And so if we are counted among the believers and counted among those that have the Lord Jesus Christ living in our hearts because he revealed Jesus to us and because we accepted the plan of salvation and we invited him into our heart and life, we're one of the few that found that path of righteousness. We're one of the few that are on the straight and narrow. And how fortunate is that? If we never got another thing, if we never had another word than John 3.16, if that's the only word that we had, and if all we had was the promise of eternal life, and if we never had a blessing, if we never had any other value in this entire human existence and earthly sojourn, if all we got was our name written in the book of life, and that we had no relationship with God in this life, it would be worth it. All the pain, all of the trouble, all the trials, all the tests, all the difficulties that we go through, it would be worth it because our life is just so fleeting. It's just a little breath, a little vapor. And many of us were on the last part of our vapor of life, and we will be gone. And where we spend eternity is extremely important. This life is not in respect to having a good time or having it our way or enjoying ourselves or whatever. We're going to enjoy ourselves in heaven. We're going to be there forevermore. We're not going to have any pain or suffering. There's no trials, tests, and tribulation. There is no role that we're going to have to complete that's going to tax us or stretch us. We're never going to be denied. We're never going to lack anything at all. We're never going to have to face bankruptcy. We're never going to have to face a car payment or house payment that we come short in funds to pay. We're never going to have a worry or a concern. We're never going to be standing in the hospital room at the deathbed of somebody that we love that we're going to have to lose because they're not going to make it. We're never going to have to suffer that in heaven. And so if we live to be 100 years old or more, it's so small in comparison to eternity that is without end. And so we focus so much on the fleeting, of, on the vapor, on the trials of this little tiny life, this little space in eternity, which is called time. And when you think of the time that God created as a capsule within eternity, that our spot in that capsule of eternity is so small and insignificant that it's not worth risking our eternal destiny for anything that we could receive or do or have in this earth. It's not worth the risk. It's not worth it to give up eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord for anything, any person, any place, anything, any pleasure, any amount of fame and fortune, or any blessing, or blessing ourselves, or someone else um, blessing us. It's not worth it to give up forever for this little tiny fragment of space and time that we live in. And so I encourage you to invest in those things that are eternal, because everything else is going to pass away. That years ago they had a plaque that said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And then we're, when we're doing an assessment of this year, 
Can you assess that really quickly and say how much of this year, 360 days a year, and then you can break it down into how many months and how many weeks and how many days and how many minutes and how many seconds, how much of that time have we had that we invested for eternity? And all of us would come up with a fraction of it. I doubt that we would have perhaps even 10% of our life that the tithe of our year in time and energy and effort and prayer and seeking God and ministering that we could say that he even had a tenth of the days, the hours, the weeks, the months, the year that we have lived. And that's just one year. And so when we do an assessment, rather than get into condemnation over what we should have done, could have done, if only we would have done, and we fell short of the goal that we had at the beginning of the year, then we need to assess that and do as the Apostle Paul did, who had many regrets, who had many things that he could remember, many things that he had done against the cause of Christ in ignorance, he said, and it was ignorance. He did it in the zeal for the church, and it wasn't called the church, but for the Jewish people, and he did that out of a love for God, but it was against God, and he didn't realize that. But regardless of how we failed, how we flunked, how we fell short of what we could have done, should have done, if only we would have done, or did things that we wished we hadn't done, that's not going to help us. The Apostle Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind it, and press forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ. And oftentimes we're looking at the high calling, but we're not looking at the mark. You know, he said to look at the mark, you know, and there's a mark on us, number one, and there's a mark when you're running a race on your mark, get set, go. So we're looking at the mark. We're looking first at the beginning of, it's the beginning of an end, and the end um, is behind us, and so we're approaching something new. And we don't need to redo, we don't need to repeat, And we don't need to be in condemnation over what we wished would have happened or what things that we are disappointed in that perhaps God didn't answer this prayer the way that we wanted him to or that we didn't have fulfillment in this area of our lives. But really what we need to do is forget those things that are behind. Take an assessment and say, okay, I want to do better. I want to have a better year. I want to do more for the kingdom of God. I want to do less for myself. I want to be of more value to the one that gave his life for me. I want to promote the things of heaven rather than the things of this earth. I want to invest in what is eternal rather than that which is just for time. I want to invest in what I will be rewarded for rather than to receive a fleeting reward in this life. Because we can bless ourselves, but those blessings will not last beyond your last breath here on earth. We can't take it with us. We can't take our bodies with us. We can spend hours in front of the mirror and we can, <laughs> we can make ourselves so very presentable and most people look really good in the coffin. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever seen how, how the, the artists are involved in making this person look 20 years younger? They don't have a wrinkle on their face and they've got makeup on and they, they perfect that industry to make them look really good. But what's good about being dead, you know? It's not of any value at all. It's just going to the grave. And and it's going to be the same with all the things that we can do in our lifetime. We can make ourselves look good. We can can do all kinds of things to invest in the flesh. And I'm not against taking care of yourself. I'm not against um, looking in the mirror and fixing yourself up and and, uh, making yourself appealing. But I'm saying that should not be our viewpoint that we're so ingrained in how we look and how we present ourselves 
and we're failing to look at the realm of the spirit. How are we presented ourselves? What about the hidden man of the heart? It's much more important about what's hidden than that which is revealed. What God sees and what he sees about us. He doesn't care if you have your makeup on. He cares about your clean heart. He doesn't care if you take 10 showers a day to make sure you don't have a drop of sweat on you. He cares about you being bathed in his glory and bathed in his blood. And, and he cares about the condition of your heart. And so in our lives, and all of us, I'm not preaching at you, I'm part of you. I'm down here with you. That uh, <laughs> I'm just the same as you, a human being. And to err is to be human. To be human is to err both ways. And so we're going we're gonna to have sin. We're going to have besetting sin. We're going to have regrets. We're going to have times in our lives when we have failed. But thankfully, Jesus never fails. And we don't have to repeat that. We don't have to go over and over and over the same thing in the same way, doing the same things that will cause us in another year to finish that year and have the same kind of regrets that we might have today. We have a choice to make, and I believe that it's getting on your mark and getting set and go, that we have to finish the race, and that's not retreating. That's not going back. That's not going back to where we can fix this or change this or do something from from that point of view and that vantage point. That's not where we're at. We're here. We have finished that. We have completed that. We need to only remember it in respect of the finished product of this year. And if we're not pleased with it, you can't fix it. You can't change it. You don't need to spend hours and hours regretting and pounding on yourself and beating yourself up for what you didn't do, what you wanted to do, and you didn't finish, or you didn't even start it, you know, never mind that. We got a brand new start. And so let's forget about what was, and let's move forward to what can be because of all the potential of a coming year. That as long as we have breath in our lungs, we have an opportunity just like every person on the face of the earth. And we have a choice. They have a choice. Their choices should not affect your choice. If you're the only one that wants to go to heaven and everybody in your family doesn't want to and they're against believing in God, do you want to go to hell and be with them? No. You want to do everything you can to be light in front of them, hoping that your testimony and your life will tell for Jesus and make a difference in their lives. But we cannot compromise. We cannot get in agreement with what we know is, is hurting them just to have fellowship with them. We have no need for that. We need to be the salt and the light that we are supposed to be, and we can be supportive of a person without agreeing with them and becoming like that. You know, we don't want to do that. We want to live for Jesus. We don't want to get in condemnation. We don't go around shaming people. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't do it to you, and he's not wanting us to do it to anybody else. What he wants for us to do is to love them into the kingdom of God and pray for one another that they may be healed. And that effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. And that healing has to do with more than just a physical healing. There's emotional healing and mental healing and there is relational healing and financial healing, situational healing. We need healing in many aspects of our lives and the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. So we are to pray. If you can't speak and they won't accept your words, God accepts your prayers. He accepts your intercession for them. And the good news is that he's doing the same thing for you and for me. He ever lives to make intercession for us. So if we're not hearing his word and responding, he doesn't give up on us. He intercedes for us. 
because he paid a tremendous price for us, for every single person on the face of the earth that was and is and is to come. The same cost for their salvation is what he paid for for you and I. And so it's important for those that are lost to be found. And if you can't be that instrument, then pray that God will use somebody else to reach them, whatever it takes, so that they will not spend an eternity in hell. That should be our greatest desire in our lives as a Christian. Not about what we get or who approves of us or who likes us or who supports us or who agrees with us. Never mind that. Who can we influence to cross over on the other side at the end of the trail to be in heaven rather than hell? That we would win a soul. We don't win them to us. You don't have to win them as a friend. You don't need to win them as somebody that's an important figure, a significant person in your life. You can be that significant person in someone else's life, whether they ever talk to you or do lunch with you the rest of your life. You may not ever receive a gift from them or an acclimate from them or appreciation from them. And you would be joining with Jesus Christ who died for everyone that goes to hell, just like he died for you. He valued them just as much as you. And so he wants us to value every person. Every person counts. Every person counts. Every single person counts. And we want to do what we can for the cause of Christ, to win them to the Lord, not to us. For them to find a friend in Jesus may not be your friend at all, might be your enemy, but if they can find a friend in Jesus, and they can miss hell, then you will be friends in heaven. <laughs> Think about it. Which is forevermore. Your worst enemy that you may have prayed for and they got saved and you don't even like them. <laughs> you don't want to be around them. But if they make it to heaven, they're going to be a different person. And if you are instrumental in winning souls, that's wise. It doesn't take wisdom of this world. It takes the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to know how to win souls to the Lord and bring them into the kingdom of God, which is a costly thing. It may cost you a lot. It costs Jesus everything. So I believe that our greatest focus should be on the healing of the soul. He that when souls is wise, is wonderful for the healing ministry. I love to see people healed. I love to see them delivered. But the greatest miracle of all is when they're saved. When they receive Christ as their Savior and Lord, I may never see them again. It may have cost me a lot to reach them. It may have been miserable for me to even reach that soul. But for that one person to be in eternity in heaven forever, it cost me something, cost God everything, giving his only begotten son, cost Jesus his death on the cross, cost the Holy Spirit who is given unto us to draw us and woo us unto him and reveal him unto us. Amen. Cost God everything, every investment at risk. And all the investment that you have for the kingdom of God is at risk too. But I'll tell you what, I will take the risk if after everything is said and done, if after the end of the year that I look at the end of the year and I see more liabilities than assets, if I see that my investment did not bring any profit to me but losses instead, how many can say that? You can look at, at what you began with in the year and you look at what you have now and you are running in the red. You lost rather than gained. 
in your personal life, in your personal finances, in your personal relationships, that the losses were greater than the gains. But yet, at the end, you can know that your investment wasn't for yourself. It was for the kingdom of God and his glory. So I believe that our lives need to tell for Jesus. I need my life to tell for Jesus. And never mind my losses, and never mind that my investments were totally at risk, and that at the end of this time, I can assess and I, the gain was less than the loss, and the losses were greater than the gain. But the Apostle Paul said, what things were gained to him, he counted them but loss. But dug under his feet the things that were valuable and of gain to him so that he might obtain Christ. So it is with each one of us that our losses that are personal should almost be a trophy to us. Can we make our losses a trophy instead of something that we're mourning over? Because if you've invested in the kingdom of God and you come out personally at the worst for it, we need to count it all joy. When we fall into divers, many temptations. When he was beaten, when he was shipwrecked, when he was imprisoned, and when he was finally killed for the cause of Christ, he counted all the things that were pleasurable and personally advantageous to him as loss just to win Christ and to live a life that was going to be a permanent loss of his own in order to win souls. Jesus did. It's unbelievable when almost, well, we believe it because it's in the Bible, but it, it's, it's frightening to think of human nature, how that after he had healed the sick, and the maimed that were made whole, and the blind would see, and the deaf would hear, and the crippled would walk, and the paralyzed would move, and the infirmed were made completely whole. All the multitudes were healed and delivered. Demons were cast out, and the crowd saw that. And then... He was concerned about their physical conditions. I don't want them to go home with fainting on the way because they haven't eaten. I'm, I want them to be fed before they leave. And so we know the story about the five loaves and two fishes, that he broke them, blessed them, distributed them, had the disciples distribute it, and all of them were filled. And then he took ship and went on the other side, and some of them were looking for him. And when they found him, he said, you weren't looking for me because of the miracles. Really? Really? You were not seeking Jesus because of these phenomenal miracles. The blind saw, the deaf heard, the lame walked, the maimed were made whole. If they lost a limb, it came back just like that. Right in front of their eyes, they saw miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, and demons were gone, and people were delivered. But they weren't seeking him for that. They wanted him to feed them miraculously forevermore. They didn't care about the sick, the hurting, the infirmed, the demonic, the bound. They only cared about their daily bread. How small can we reduce ourselves when we would give everything for our daily bread, our daily comforts, our daily well-being, and not have any concern about what is eternal last breath here on earth.
We can't take it with us. We can't take our bodies with us. We can spend hours in front of the mirror and we can, <laughs> we can make ourselves so very presentable and most people look really good in the coffin. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever seen how, how the, the artists are involved in making this person look 20 years younger? They don't have a wrinkle on their face and they've got makeup on and they, they perfect that industry to make them look really good. But what's good about being dead, you know? It's not of any value at all. It's just going to the grave. And, and it's going to be the same with all the things that we can do in our lifetime. We can make ourselves look good. We can, we can do all kinds of things to invest in the flesh. And I'm not against taking care of yourself. I'm not against um, looking in the mirror and fixing yourself up and, and uh, making yourself appealing. But I'm saying that should not be our viewpoint that we're so ingrained in how we look and how we present ourselves and we're failing to look at the realm of the spirit how are we presented ourselves what about the hidden man of the heart it's much more important about what's hidden than that which is revealed what god sees and what he sees about us he doesn't care if you have your makeup on he cares about your clean heart he doesn't care if you take 10 showers a day to make sure you don't have a drop of sweat on you. He cares about you being bathed in his glory and bathed in his blood. And, and he cares about the condition of your heart. And so in our lives, and all of us, I'm not preaching at you. I'm part of you. I'm down here with you. That uh, <laughs> I'm just the same as you, a human being. And to err is to be human. To be human is to err both ways. And so we're going we're gonna to have sin. We're going to have besetting sin. We're going to have regrets. We're going to have times in our lives when we have failed. But thankfully, Jesus never fails. And we don't have to repeat that. We don't have to go over and over and over the same thing in the same way, doing the same things that will cause us in another year to finish that year and have the same kind of regrets that we might have today. We have a choice to make. And I believe that it's getting on your mark and getting set and go, that we have to finish the race. And that's not retreating. That's not going back. That's not going back to where we can fix this or change this or do something from, from that point of view and that vantage point. That's not where we're at. We're here. We have finished that. We have completed that. We need to only remember it in respect of the finished product of this year. And if we're not pleased with it, you can't fix it. You can't change it. You don't need to spend hours and hours regretting and pounding on yourself and beating yourself up for what you didn't do what you wanted to do and you didn't finish or you didn't even start it, you know, never mind that. We got a brand new start. And so let's forget about what was and let's move forward to what can be because of all the potential of a coming year. That as long as we have breath in our lungs, we have an opportunity just like every person on the face of the earth. And we have a choice. They have a choice. Their choices should not affect your choice. If you're the only one that wants to go to heaven and everybody in your family doesn't want to and they're against believing in God, do you want to go to hell and be with them? No. You want to do everything you can to be light in front of them, hoping that your testimony and your life will tell for Jesus and make a difference in their lives. But we cannot compromise. We cannot get in agreement with what we know is, is hurting them just to have fellowship with them. We have no need for that. We need to be the salt and the light that we are supposed to be and we can be supportive of a person without agreeing with them and becoming like that. You know, we don't want to do that. We want to live for Jesus. We don't want to get in condemnation. We don't go around shaming people. Jesus didn't do that. 
He didn't do it to you, and he's not wanting us to do it to anybody else. What he wants for us to do is to love them into the kingdom of God and pray for one another that they may be healed. And that effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. And that healing has to do with more than just a physical healing. There's emotional healing and mental healing and there is relational healing and financial healing, situational healing. We need healing in many aspects of our lives and the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. So we are to pray. If you can't speak and they won't accept your words, God accepts your prayers. He accepts your intercession for them. And the good news is that he's doing the same thing for you and for me. He ever lives to make intercession for us. So if we're not hearing his word and responding, he doesn't give up on us. He intercedes for us because he paid a tremendous price for us, for every single person on the face of the earth that was and is and is to come. The same cost for their salvation is what he paid for for you and I. And so it's important for those that are lost to be found. And if you can't be that instrument, then pray that God will use somebody else to reach them, whatever it takes, so that they will not spend an eternity in hell. That should be our greatest desire in our lives as a Christian. Not about what we get or who approves of us or who likes us or who supports us or who agrees with us. Never mind that. Who can we influence to cross over on the other side at the end of the trail to be in heaven rather than hell? That we would win a soul. We don't win them to us. You don't have to win them as a friend. You don't need to win them as somebody that's an important figure, a significant person in your life. You can be that significant person in someone else's life, whether they ever talk to you or do lunch with you the rest of your life. You may not ever receive a gift from them or an acclimate from them or appreciation from them. And you would be joining with Jesus Christ who died for everyone that goes to hell, just like he died for you. He valued them just as much as you. And so he wants us to value every person. Every person counts. Every person counts. Every single person counts. And we want to do what we can for the cause of Christ, to win them to the Lord, not to us. For them to find a friend in Jesus. May not be your friend at all, might be your enemy, but if they can find a friend in Jesus, and they can miss hell, then you will be friends in heaven. (laughs) Think about it. Which is forevermore. Your worst enemy that you may have prayed for and they got saved and you don't even like them. (laughs) You don't want to be around them. But if they make it to heaven, they're going to be a different person. And if you are instrumental in winning souls, that's wise. It doesn't take wisdom of this world. It takes the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to know how to win souls to the Lord and bring them into the kingdom of God, which is a costly thing. It may cost you a lot. It costs Jesus everything. So I believe that our greatest focus should be on the healing of the soul. He that when souls is wise, is wonderful for the healing ministry. I love to see people healed. I love to see them delivered. But the greatest miracle of all is when they're saved. When they receive Christ as their Savior and Lord, I may never see them again. It may have cost me a lot to reach them. It may have been miserable for me to even reach that soul. 
But for that one person to be in eternity in heaven forever, it cost me something, cost God everything, giving it his only begotten son, cost Jesus' death on the cross, cost the Holy Spirit was given unto us to draw us and woo us unto him and reveal him unto us. Amen. Cost God everything, every investment at risk. And all the investment that you have for the kingdom of God is at risk too. But I'll tell you what, I will take the risk if after everything is said and done, if after the end of the year that I look at the end of the year and I see more liabilities than assets, if I see that my investment did not bring any profit to me, but losses instead. How many can say that? You can look at, at what you began with in the year and you look at what you have now and you are running in the red. You lost rather than gained in your personal life, in your personal finances, in your personal relationships, that the losses were greater than the gains. But yet, at the end, you can know that your investment wasn't for yourself. It was for the kingdom of God and his glory. So I believe that our lives need to tell for Jesus. I need my life to tell for Jesus. And never mind my losses and never mind that my investments were totally at risk and that at the end of this time I can assess and I, the gain was less than the loss and the losses were greater than the gain. But the Apostle Paul said, what things were gained to him, he counted them but lost. But dug under his feet the things that were valuable and of gain to him so that he might obtain Christ. So it is with each one of us that our losses that are personal should almost be a trophy to us. Can we make our losses a trophy instead of something that we're mourning over? Because if you've invested in the kingdom of God and you come out personally at the worst for it, we need to count it all joy when we fall into divers' many temptations, when he was beaten, when he was shipwrecked, when he was imprisoned, and when he was finally killed for the cause of Christ. He counted all the things that were pleasurable and personally advantageous to him as loss just to win Christ. And to live a life that was going to be a permanent loss of his own in order to win souls. Jesus did. It's unbelievable when almost, well, we believe it because it's in the Bible, but it, it's, it's frightening to think of human nature, how that after he had healed the sick and the maimed that were made whole and the blind would see and the deaf would hear and the crippled would walk and the paralyzed would move and the infirmed were made completely whole, all the multitudes were healed and delivered. Demons were cast out, and the crowd saw that. And then he was concerned about their physical conditions. I don't want them to go home with fainting on the way because they haven't eaten. I'm, I want them to be fed before they leave. And so we know the story about the five loaves and two fishes that he broke them, blessed them, distributed them, had the disciples distribute it, and all of them were filled. And then he took ship and went on the other side, and some of them were looking for him. And when they found him, he said, you weren't looking for me because of the miracles. Really? Really? You were not seeking Jesus because of these phenomenal miracles? The blind saw, the deaf heard, the lame walked, the maimed were made whole. If they lost a limb, it came back just like that. 
Right in front of their eyes, they saw miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, and demons were gone, and people were delivered. But they weren't seeking him for that. They wanted him to feed them miraculously forevermore. They didn't care about the sick, the hurting, the infirmed, the demonic, the bound. They only cared about their daily bread. How small can we reduce ourselves when we would give everything for our daily bread, our daily comforts, our daily well-being, and not have any concern about what is eternal. We're so concerned about the here and now that we have no sight about what's coming forever and ever and ever. So that's terrible. I thought, how can they be so shallow as to only care about bread? I mean, you know, maybe we could think of something better than daily bread. Oh, Moses gave them in the wilderness manna every day. They went out there when they were good, bad, or ugly and got the manna. They could be rebelling him against the Lord and the manna would still be there. Every single day without fail, they had food to eat, the bread from heaven. Jesus said if Moses didn't give it to him, God the Father did. Just like he multiplied the loaves and the fishes when Jesus blessed it, the Father caused it to be more than enough. But to get our focus on that, I just wanted to share one more thing with you that I think is incredibly important. When Jesus was in the wilderness, he overcame when he was hungry in the wilderness by himself. He had just been filled to capacity and overflowing. The Spirit of God came upon him, and he had that anointing without measure. But immediately the Spirit, says the Spirit, took him in the wilderness. He was there for 40 days by himself, hungry, alone, nobody there, feeling maybe kind of lonely, nobody to talk to, nobody to do anything with, no communications, and very hungry. And fasting, fasting, in a, in a relationship with the Father, all by himself, in communication with him. And here comes the devil. You know, why not an angel? That happened later. But first the devil comes to tempt him. And it seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Well, you're hungry, you haven't eaten for all this time. You know, you're not going to make it out of the wilderness. You think you're going to make it out as a living person? You know, you've got a ways to go. It's one thing to be here for 40 days, but you've got to go back on an empty stomach and weak and why don't you just, if you're the son of God and you've got these great powers, that anointing, just command these stones to be made into bread. How many of us would have done that? Have you ever thought about it? Would have we done that? We would have think, well, you know, what? it's not going to hurt anybody. I didn't steal anything from anybody. I didn't go rob the, the neighbor of their bread that's sitting there on the window and cooling after they made it. I didn't do any of that. I just took these useless rocks and commanded them to be in the bread because, God, you know I'm hungry. You know that I'm starving. You know I'm weak. How would we have been? You know, but Jesus overcame that. He overcame trying to promote himself. Well, get up on the pinnacle of the temple and, and uh, fall down. Angels will be given charge over you concerning you to keep you in all your ways. That's the Bible. We can take the Bible and we can do just about anything we want to and justify whatever we do with the gifts of God or, or the call of God or just God himself or the word of God. We can make it work for us the way we want it to, manipulate it to, to be what we want it to be, to satisfy our flesh, which is enmity with ourselves and God. This is just not the right thing to do. So he forsook that. He forsook having people see him. 
as the Christ that would fall off the top of the temple and, and be miraculously fine, get up and walk away unscathed. Show everybody, show the world who you are. Or command these stones to be bread so you can satisfy a need that you have. Everybody knows that after you haven't eaten for a, a month you're, or more than a month, you're going to be needing bread. It's just the right thing to do. But it wasn't the God thing to do. We can do the right thing, and it's not the God thing. And so this life, as difficult as it is, trials, tests, tribulation, People hating you, abusing you, rebuking you when they should be rebuking themselves, all that. You know, we go through a lot of things to get through this life. But we need to be more like the Apostle Paul. I don't want to get too much like him because I'm not sure I want the guillotine. But I'm just saying, just saying, you can post that if you want. Let's just be real, you know. Do you want to get your head cut off? <laughs> You want to go to prison like he did, shipwrecked? You know, it's great the things that he suffered for us to be able to read about, but none of us really want to, we want to be an Apostle Paul, really? You want to get in his shoes and go through all this stuff? You know, I think he'll just be the Apostle Paul and I'll just be Prophet June. You know, maybe my road will be a little less rocky than his was. Maybe not. But regardless of the road that we take, I believe that we need to put our values more on God and less on this world and life. And regardless of the assessment at the end of the year, that it costs you more than it profited you, we haven't gotten to the place of reward yet. It's on the other side. And the greatest reward for you and I will be when we see someone that would not have made it and because of our prayers, our gifts, our ministry, our contact, they're in heaven and not hell. That's eternal. That would be worth a whole lot more to me than silver and gold after my works are tried. I would rather have it be a person. I would rather have it be somebody that made it because maybe a word or maybe, maybe my forbearance, maybe I didn't give up on them when I would have liked to, or my forgiveness or whatever it is because I didn't go to the cross for them. But that cross we carry that's personal, but it isn't the cross that Jesus bore for you and I. And his, he did it for us so that we would have eternal life. How great it is to focus on what is eternal rather than time because we can all validate our miserable feelings, our complaints. We can validate it. We can validate our unforgiveness. We can validate our anger. We can validate how we feel. But let's not focus on those things that are so meaningless. Don't validate that feeling but put your effort into something that's going to be permanent. And if it doesn't work out and all investments at risk, at least you will be rewarded for your effort, that you made an effort towards life, eternal life for someone else so that they would make it. And if they don't choose him, it won't be because you failed to tell them or to pray for them, or to be light and salt, to try to make a difference in someone else's life.